green light. Thank you very much, Debbie. How's the sound? Can you hear me in the back row? Great. All right. I'd like to uh, also say thank you for coming today. Uh, maybe stir craziness has set in or whatever, but for, for whatever reason you're out and about, thanks for being here. I am going to spend the next hour or so talking about William Ganaway Brownlow, but first a little bit of promotion. This is for the big final Third, uh, fifth, fifth year of the sesquicentennial uh, events that have happened statewide. The state is coming here to Knoxville for their um, final state signature event. And Knoxville itself is going to, the next day on Saturday and Sunday, uh, do a whole lot of interesting things Civil War related here in Knoxville. So I hope you listen for the advertisements. So details will be available. But there's going to be a website brochure, all that kind of thing. And to what extent you can participate, that would be terrific. For one thing, on Friday night um, of that weekend, we're going to have Ron Maxwell, the man who put out the movies Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. He's going to speak at a dinner at the convention center. And we hope everybody with Civil War interest will show up for that one. All right, let us commence here. With this week of weather, I have been shifting my presentation around to multiple devices with multiple versions of uh, PowerPoint. So please bear with me if some of these things are not as clear as they could be. At any rate, as I started this lecture several weeks ago with research, coming with my own uh, partial information about Brownlow, looking at the whole story believing I really wanted to like this guy. That was my original prejudice. <laughs> Finding it hard to do so, but then pulling back and maybe seeing his, his whole experience in a larger context. In any case, there are certain Civil War personalities that would never have shown without that Civil War, uh, the, the sequence of events that thrust them into prominence. U.S. Grant was one. He was not doing well in the civilian world, and uh, he ended up, as you know, president of the United States. Belle Boyd, on a very different track, uh, she was not going to be a celebrity at all without the Civil War, and there she was. But William Brownlow, I think, was the guy that he was, the, that he uh, began in a certain style. He continued that style. He was extremely consistent, and he found himself in a position of power and control that was way beyond anything that he could have expected. But he, again, brought the same kind of um, rhetoric, attitude, belligerence, self-confidence, and total fearlessness to the roles that he found himself playing throughout the Civil War. So let's, I want to look at his progress, how, how he started, how he changed, how he finished, and what his legacy was. Now, there are many images of Brownlow. Where is William P. Sanders, one of my favorites? There are two known photographs. Brownlow has so many different portraits taken, po painted portraits, studio portraits, publicity shots. We've, we are very able to look into the face and features of this man and see who, who he, what he looked like early on. And this is what he looked like as a young man. But think about where did he come from? And what was his path leading up to the Civil War? Well, first of all, he was born in 1805. And so he was up on the Virginia border, southwest Virginia. His parents both died within about three months of, his, of, of the, each other. His, mother, his father died first, and then about three months later, his mother died, multiple siblings. He was 11 years old. He went to apprentice with an uncle worked in carpentry, decided it was not for him. Um, but he is a man who started out, or a boy who started out with no advantages whatsoever. He had no parents, he had no money, and you would not expect from that beginning that he would become as famous as he did in 60 years. Um, he became a Methodist circuit rider. Now this is the time, you think about the 1820s out here on the frontier as it was then. Um, I, I really did not know very much until my last lecture about early religion out here. And this was no holes barred. Uh, he, was, he was on the front lines of establishing uh, religion here on 
in East Tennessee. He was a Methodist circuit rider, and the Methodist circuit riders were uh, very um, hands-on, loud uh, sermons. He found out he had a very great natural ability for oration, and he used it, and he was uh, for, he came into the forefront. Even though he was in the wilds of Tennessee, he did some traveling a little bit into the, for, uh, as part of the Methodist Church, and um, he, he just was a personality. He, he spoke up. He spoke up a lot, <laughs> and he became uh, a very um, a, a recognizable Methodist circuit writer out on, the, uh, out on the frontier. In 1839, he married. He settled down. He went to Elizabethton. And he started a newspaper. Again, not only did he have a flair for oration, he had a flair for writing. He's self-educated. This is a guy who went to work at 11 years old. He, was not, he doesn't have an Ivy League degree. He was not trained in journalism. Uh, he certainly was not trained in political correctness. And he was, however, he found that uh, his style his way of putting together the most uh, incredible string of adjectives he could use for some people and synonyms, um, he was basically always in conflict with his environment. He was against Democrats. Even though Methodists were his church, he, he was very critical of the leadership, especially in the 1840s when the church divided. Uh, he, oh, he, he didn't like Baptists at all. Presbyterians were way down on the list. Catholics, <laughs> the things he had to say about Catholics, were <laughs> they're still offensive. Uh, progressives, conservatives, the upper classes, abolitionists, slaveholders, Negroes, bankers, secessionists, he was down on all of these things. Uh, he was, however, very much pro-East Tennessee. He was a cheerleader from the beginning. He was pro-development. He was pro-railroad. He's the one who, if he didn't come up with it, he at least used it early. The Switzerland of, the, of America, that's what he called East Tennessee. He, he had, again, a flair for words, sloganism, uh, branding, as we all know today, branding is important. He, he, that's what he did for East Tennessee. He was sincere. And he, he got the word out. Uh, there's nothing like the only newspaper in the area. And of course, he wasn't the only. But he used his platform and his influence in a very positive way for developing East Tennessee. Um, however, he started early on personal feuds. He and Andrew Johnson did not get along. He's in Upper East Tennessee. Andrew Johnson's up in Greenville. They knew each other. They did strike a truce for the Civil War when they both became Republicans. But as you remember, um, Andrew Johnson started out as a Democrat. And he had <laughs> I don't think Brownlow ever met a Democrat he liked. But once Andrew Johnson became a Republican and their goals were similar, there was a temporary truce after the war that dissolved. Um, he also had a very serious feud with a man called Landon C. Haynes, who was from Upper East Tennessee, and who was um, prominent throughout the war. He was a Confederate. Uh, he was the man who was in charge here in Knoxville when Sanders came in 1863 in June and attacked the town. Um, and uh, uh, he, that role was publicized later by Brownlow at when the uh, Union was back in control. He wanted to be sure that everybody knew how um, uh, how active Landon C. Haynes was in Confederate-controlled uh, Knoxville. Um, he moved to Knoxville in 1849. He moved to it, and this is because he basically got ridden out of Elizabeth, Elizabeth, and then he went to Jonesboro and started up another newspaper, and that did not go too well either. And so he came to Knoxville. They already had two papers in town. They had a Democratic paper and a Whig paper, and they didn't want another one. Uh, so he came into town and said, here I am, and uh, again, started making more enemies, and however, flourished. His paper, the subscriptions were high, and people liked, well, if you were on his side and you agreed with the things that he had to say about his enemies and um, others, uh, it was great stuff. It was like uh, having somebody slug it out for you in a way that you might not be able to do yourself. Um, slander, well, if you can prove it. If it's true, it's not slander. But some of the things he had to say, uh, he was sued a lot. And he was also, there were attempts made on his life. 
Somebody shot through his, into his house. Uh, he was hit over the head so hard he was in bed for two weeks, probably had a concussion. A lot of people say that he, his personality was even in, more intense after that incident, and that may be true. But he, they, he got into a duel or a fight with Landon C. Haynes. Um, guns were involved. He was shot through the thigh. Uh, I mean, this was a guy who said it and then took the consequences and then said more and never slowed down. Uh, in the early in the 1850s, early 1850s, he came out very pro-temperance. He was not a drinking man, although there is an early story of him being just roaring drunk at a Methodist something or other. And uh, whether or not that's true, it's hard to prove. But he swore off, swore off the hard stuff, and uh, he was a temperance leader. Temperance Hill in East Knoxville, that's where Temperance Hall was. This was a Methodist-associated church. It was Parson Brownlow, this is his Methodist church, and um, so he was associated, identified with the temperance movement. In politics, he was a Whig. He was an old line Whig, hated Democrats, could find nothing good to say about temp Democrats, and of course, in, as the Republican Party came into being with Lincoln, he, uh, he associated with Lincoln and that side of politics, and as I said, he did promote progress for East Tennessee. Religion was always right for criticism. Last month's lecture, if you were here, he had just terrible things to say about all of the clergy and the involvement of the churches in promoting the Southern cause. And at the brink of war, he was a unionist, but he was very much pro-slavery. Again, the things he had to say about African Americans and slavery are just, you, you just don't even put them up on the screen today. But that was his stand. He did not change much, although when the what he would have considered necessary for the war effort, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he kind of grudgingly went along with it. But he never did change his personal views of slavery and the, uh, the role of African Americans. He was very much in favor of colonization, of freeing slaves and sending them to Liberia or South America or the Caribbean or anywhere but here. Um, and as the war came close, he was instrumental in getting pro-union conventions, first here in May at Temperance Hall, and then reconvened in Greenville in June of 61. But almost immediately, the state vote went pro-secession. Is there a question? Yeah. Um, he, uh, 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 the, the legality of it was Tennessee did not secede exactly. It, declared its independence from the United States, and then aligned itself with the, with the uh, Confederate States. So legally, I guess it's a little bit of difference in the way they did it, but it ended up the same. And Tennessee was the final state to join the Confederacy. Now, back to his personal life. This was in 1839. He married Miss Eliza O'Brien, settled in Elizabethton, as I said, but he soon had to leave. They did have, eventually have seven children, two sons, and five daughters. And it was actually lawyer Thomas Nelson. He was later a unionist for a while, and then he, when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, he very famously wrote a letter saying to, okay, East Tennesseans, now that they've done this, we're all pro, we're all secessionists, right? Well, no, they weren't, and, and Brownlow certainly wasn't, and many others weren't. And the letter apparently made very little difference, but it, it did show, um, Again, the contentiousness of issues here in East Tennessee. Anyway, it was Br Nelson who suggested in the beginning, in 1839, that Brown will start a newspaper. He recognized his talent, and he also thought that the entertaining style, his extreme rhetoric, would sell newspapers. And he was absolutely right. Um, a little bit of a historic note, the O'Brien family itself was uh, conflicted during the war, the brother of Eliza, and in, you look at the old uh, census, in 1850, the brother was living with Brownlow and his wife here in Knoxville. Well, he, he joined the Confederate Army, I believe it was from Louisiana, you can verify that, but at any rate, he came here with Longstreet, attacked Fort Sanders, was one of the very few, went up and over the top inside the fort, and lived to tell about it. Not many made it into the fort, and most who did uh, were immediately dispatched. But he became a prisoner, and he actually recuperated in Brownlow's house as a Confederate 
uh, soldier and then went back to fight for the Confederacy. So it shows you that uh, it was, there, even within Brownlow's own, fa own family, there, was, there were two sides that were being, uh, that, well, I can imagine the nighttime discussions or what, what kind of discussion they might have had if they talked while he was recuperating in Brownlow's house. Now, anyway, Brownlow really totally invented himself, and he seems never to have doubted the righteousness of his opinions. He did change, as I said, he went from very pro-slavery to uh, um, supporting the Emancipation Proclamation. That was an, it was a convenience, um, and so it wasn't as if there were things that he did not manage to uh, kind of flip-flop on if it was uh, the most expedient thing to do. But for the most part, he kept pretty much his, his opinions, they, they did, not, did not change much in the course of his 38 years of publications. Um, he had already established civic conflicts in Knoxville when the war approached. For instance, he quarreled with, there was a radical paper called the Southern Citizen, which is a pro-secession newspaper published by William G. Swan, he, he's, you'll recognize his name, and an Irish patriot named John Mitchell. He came here for, in exile, and they put out this newspaper, and um, he threatened Swan with a revolver uh, that Brownlow did. So there was this issue going on. In the late 1850s, he turned his attention to the Democratic Party and the Democratic leaders, and following, this was a huge scandal, the Bank of East Tennessee in 1858. This was uh, the Crozier's, uh, John H. Crozier, A.R. Crozier, Crozier, William Churchwell, J.G.M. Ramsey. These guys basically, um, they were the directors of a bank that failed. And Brownlow was all over him. He actually got a, a, a judgment against them um, and to, for the depositors, but he never actually got any money back. Um, interesting story, the, uh, was it Swan? Hmm, better say. There were, there, the uh, fact was that the directors didn't do too badly, but the depositors did. And of course, that's, those things have happened again and again. And uh, this was one that Brownlow made very public, published the names of the directors, and as he said, keep it before the people. That was one of his taglines for putting things out there. Anyway, when the war came, all of these people that he had fought with chose the Confederacy. So as a Union man, and he had been all along, even pro-slavery, pro uh, these were his natural, his already existing enemies. A war didn't help. Anyway, this is an example of his rhetoric. This is Harriet Beecher Stowe. She is as ugly as original sin, abomination in the eyes of civilized people, a tall, coarse, vulgar-looking woman, stoop-shouldered with a long yellow neck and a long peaked nose through which she speaks. <laughs> Not flattering, but an example of the way he could put words together. And, <laughs> and you can imagine in the 1850s, he was no fan of Harriet Beecher Stowe. He was very pro-slavery at that point. Anyway, this is what his papers looked like. This is just a copy. Uh, you can't see anything there. I realize that. I'm going to make it a little clearer. But this is the Whig of August 3rd, 1861. This is the second page. The war has started, and Tennessee has joined the Confederacy by this time. The paper came out on Saturdays, had four pages, five columns on a page. This paper was described by the uh, competition in town, that would be the Register, that was the Democratic paper. Uh, he called it, and this was a J. Austin Sperry who published that, he called it the most noxious and pestiferous sheet. So, you know, both sides, the, uh, you, think, you think the press is harsh now. <laughs> At any rate, the Register was no fan of the Whig. Um, but some of these articles uh, were, uh, they're still entertaining to read. Now, up here, I have the wonderful advantage, thanks to Gerald and Sandra Augustus, who brought original copies of the Whig. So there are three papers here that you can come and look at after I'm done talking that are original. They're 150 years old, and they show They've actually not yellowed, um, and they are very um, uh, clear. So if you want to come take a look at these afterwards. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about more about this paper as it uh, continued to be published, even after the Confederacy took over the town. 
um, and Brownlow continued to be extremely pro-union, he was allowed to keep publishing until October of 1861. Now, he, as I said, the, he used wa wartime topics. And by now, he is in Confederate-held East Tennessee. He has not changed his pro-union position, and he continues to sell newspapers. And he takes on things like attitudes of secesh women. He is especially incensed by the um, pretensions, as he calls it, of, of women on, of the uh, Confederate upper classes. He also looks at East Tennessee Unionist sympathies and pretty much continues to tell everybody that the whole of East Tennessee is pro-union, which is a little bit hard to believe because, well, there are certainly many, many Confederates in charge and in power, and there's an army here, and it's a little hard to tell that it's strictly pro-union. Um, drunken soldiers. He is not happy with all the troops coming through town on the train, and next month we'll look at trains in Knoxville. And, but in any case, from the earliest part of the war, the troops from the Deep South, they're all heading up to join the protection of Richmond. That's where the early battles are, and so they're coming through town. It's the only, it's the best way. It's the straightest, most direct route from the Deep South, and um, apparently, well, for sure, there are two different railroad lines, East Tennessee and Georgia, and the East Tennessee and Virginia. And so um, I'm still not absolutely positive, and somebody will tell me uh, if you had to get off and change trains, or if there were any trains that just kept on going through. I believe because of the two different companies during that time, you actually had to disembark here and get on to the other line, uh, which means that there would be troops. I mean, if it was straight shot, they wouldn't get off. They'd just keep on going. But I believe they would, did have to get off here and change trains. Um, in any case, he was also talking about personal harassment by Confederate soldiers. He's um, very discreetly flying the Union flag from his front porch. <laughs> And he says Confederate leaders are getting these young guys all whipped up, these young drunken guys all whipped up to come to his house and shout and, and brandish their firearms and insult him. And so, uh, but the makes it real easy to find him by putting that flag out front. Um, there's a postal scam. These same guys who were involved with the uh, bank going broke, um, Churchwell and Swan, uh, what happened was um, there was an an industrialist named Amos Lawrence from the North who uh, wanted to send money to Andrew Johnson and the cause in the South, and his letters were intercepted here in Knoxville. And uh, Churchwell, apparently, according to Brownlow, at least wrote back and said, sure, send the money. Thank you, Andrew Johnson. So he was expecting to intercept the check. The uh, whole thing became public. He never did get any money from Amos Lawrence, but he tried. And uh, Brownlow put it all over the front page. So that didn't look too good for the, for the uh, leaders of the Confederate government. And then he had these various uh, taglines, keep it before the people. And these were the stories that he was especially highlighting about the deficiencies of the new reign of, of, uh, of the Confederate government. And uh, he also talked about the fact that his newspapers were being thrown off on railroad bridges, that his subscribers were not getting his paper. Does that surprise anybody? I don't think so. So he's, he's complaining. You know, the mails are being tampered with, and his papers are not reaching his subscribers. Probably very true. Um, also, war news. First Battle of Manassas or Bull Run, he had, he had detailed descriptions of what happened. And, of course, that was a terrible defeat for the Union, and at the early days of the war, everybody expected one or two battles for show, and then they'd get back to the negotiations and it would be, it would be settled. Uh, and um, he, it's, it's interesting to, uh, he, he puts a spin on Manassas that makes the North look, look less incompetent, but still. Um, also, he writes about the Unionist conventions, the one happened here in um, Knoxville and then the one that went on to Greenville. And of course, basically they decided they would try to secede from the state of Tennessee. Uh, East Tennessee should become a separate neutral um, entity and of course that was not going to happen. West Virginia was formed in somewhat the same way, but West Virginia had Ohio and Pennsylvania to deal with, and East Tennessee was pretty much surrounded by Confederate territory. So it was, it was not going to happen. But he, he printed the 
findings or the conclusions of the Unionist Convention in the paper. <laughs> they frequently had an article telling people about how terrible it was to lend their newspapers and how only awful degenerates would even borrow a newspaper. Everybody should buy their own newspaper. And that was a, he printed that article regularly with different adjectives and nouns to describe those cheap people who were not buying the newspaper. Also, once the war started officially, he wasn't as blatantly, well, he was. He was always pro-union, and but he, he, made, he wanted to make clear he wasn't inciting rebellion against the Confederate government. For instance, in May of 61, this is before um, the war was declared, he advocated disabling the railroads. And that was an article in with it. He's, you know, people in East Tennessee should just shut, down, shut that railroad down. He doesn't exactly say bridge burning in those terms, but that's what he's advocating. Um, once the war is officially declared, he is he, he makes a big point of saying he never openly advocated uh, violence against the, the Confederate government. However, he was imprisoned December 5th, 1861, and there's always been this question, was he involved in the bridge burning? Um, he was hiding slash bill collecting in Sevier County near Tuckalichi Caverns when the bridge burning began, and this, and this was November 7th. Um, he had officially stopped publishing. He may legitimately have been out collecting bills, payments for his paper, but he was definitely very conveniently out of town when the bridge burning happened. Um, and he swore that he had no foreknowledge. There is a story about a servant who listened at the keyhole somewhere in either Sevier or Blunt County and came back with the story that he knew all about it and he was well aware of what was going to happen. Um, but it was, he said, she said, and they, there was really no proof that he knew about this. Um, the bridge burning episode is another whole lecture. But basically what happened was uh, the Carter brothers from Elizabethton, William Carter, the minister, um, got all the way to the Oval Office and said, I don't know, actually I don't even know if there was an Oval Office then. At any rate, he got, got, the, got to the White House. And Lincoln said, yes, good idea. Go burn those bridges and we're going to send in the troops right behind you. That's what they believed. Well, up in Kentucky, uh, William Sherman, George Thomas, um, these were the troops who were supposed to follow the advance to the, the saboteurs. And um, at the last minute, they said, whoops, no, can't go. This was literally the day that Sherman was kind of uh, sent home because he had a nervous breakdown. And um, Thomas thought it was difficult to get over the mountains. He was right that it was impossible to feed an army once they got here. Up on the border, all of the East Tennesseans who had gone up there, I mean, their main goal was just, just to come right back into East Tennessee and take their own territory, defend their farms and their families. And um, it got called off at the last minute. Nobody told the guys who were out there burning the bridges. So um, uh, unfortunately, well, they, they did burn some bridges, and they got caught. Most, many of them got caught. Um, at any rate, Brownlow says he didn't know it was going to happen and that he would have warned against it because, in fact, it caused very little damage. But what it did do was make the Confederate government extremely, they retaliated against the Unionist popu population in East Tennessee. But at any rate, um, uh, Brownlow says, well, he, he went to General Crittenden and he gave himself up, just walked into the office on December 5th, believing he had the uh, support of the government, uh, Judah Benjamin in Richmond, saying that he could leave Knoxville. Well, he, be he believes that he was intentionally deceived because J. Crozier Ramsey, who was J. G. M. Or Dr. J.G.M. Ramsey's son, and he was also district attorney in Knoxville, uh, as, soon as, as soon as Brownlow got back, he put out a warrant for his arrest. So Brownlow was arrested. And he said, you know, you can't arrest me. The R Richmond government said if I came back, I would have passage out of town. Well, he was put in jail. Uh, either probably, it's hard to say. I, I don't know if he was in Castle Fox. Castle Fox was on the property where the First Baptist Church is now. But there was another house at the corner of 
Main and what was Prince Street then. And that was used as a jail, and he may have been there too. Um, but he, he was put into jail. And um, some of the stories when you, it's always, there are always these stories when you read the contemporary press, different versions of who said what when, who was uh, ingenuous, um, exactly how the sequence of events worked in, or in somebody's favor, his favor, or against him. But in any case, he, one of the stories was that he did come back. He was uh, put into jail because he stayed too long, and I don't think that's true, but that um, by the time the wheels of justice and the communications from Richmond and the civil, the new civil uh, government, uh, district attorney, by the time all of that happened, that he was kind of inadvertently arrested and put into jail. Um, hard, hard to say how that all worked, but December, in early December, he's in jail and uh, not happy. And he, ha his particular version of the misery of the jail, so crowded that they had to take turns sleeping, that the water was the wash water of the soldiers, that the food was terrible, except he, he managed to get three, three square meals from home every day, so that was a little better for him. But um, it was, it was just ugly. But, you know, this is December. Imagine a day like this in an unheated jail, uh, so crowded that you couldn't sit down. It, it was not pleasant. And he was not a young man. He was in his 60s by then. Um, and But he was there for a while, and then he was finally um, expelled through Nashville in March of 62. But uh, his story, uh, he, he was, he, he had bronchitis. You can imagine how sick you could get in those conditions. He was allowed to go home, uh, stay and, and try to recuperate in his own house, but he had 24-hour-a-day guards. One of the young guards brought mumps and measles to the house, so everybody was sick. And um, so that was why his prolonged stay, why he didn't leave town until March, because everybody was sick and they just couldn't go. Just it's. You know, it's not grand drama, but if you can imagine a whole house full of people with mumps and measles and, and just guns at the door, it's pretty oppressive. In any case, he got out of town, and he uh, went north, and he was an immediate celebrity. This is his book, a little book. The official title of it is Sketches of the Rise, Progress, and Decline of Secession with a Narration of Personal Adventures Among the Rebels. And on the spine, all it says is Parson Brownlow's book. Everybody knew who that was. He dramatized his personal ordeals, imprisonment, and sickness, and banishment. He talked about his family being thrown out of town, um, about the Unionist persecution in general, and it was illustrated. So. This is the kind of images that were being seen in the north. This is being welcomed to Castle Fox. I think it's Castle Fox. It says it's the Knoxville jail, but I'm not sure that he wasn't in the, in the smaller jail, which was near the, the old court, well, the old courthouse. The courthouse that was on Main that's not there anymore. Um, but you can see how thrilled they are to see him. He's waving his hats, and he's just... Now, I've always wondered about this. This is an African-American at the door in a uniform, the bayonet and gun. Um, this is another one. Uh, the bridge burners. Um, this is C.A. Hahn. He was a potter. Uh, he was convicted as a bridge burner. You can see here he's got all the little babies. He's sitting on his coffin. His wife is in tears, and he's being taken to be hanged, and he was hanged. Um, this is another incident. Uh, General Danville Ledbetter he was up in Greenville, and he hanged these two men after a drumhead court-martial in Greenville, and he did leave them in public view for a while. Now, not this close to the railroad tracks, but look at this one. <laughs> this is evil baby. <laughs> and, uh, but these guys were, I mean, that's, that's pretty barbaric to leave bodies hanging so that uh, it's a lesson to those who, and, and um, um, Ledbetter was a particular, uh, well, not a favorite, but, but he, he was particularly of interest to Brownlow. And this is him. His name was Danville Ledbetter. He was from Maine. He was a West Point engineer. 
He was fighting for the CSA. Apparently, he went to Mobile, Alabama. He did a lot of work on the uh, engineering efforts around the Bay there. And the Parson had plenty to say about him. He called it Prince of Villains, Tyrants, and Murderers. An unmitigated scoundrel, tyrant, and coward went to Mobile, married a gang of Negroes, and turned secessionist. And it was a seducer of an innocent young girl in Oswego, New York, and run out of town. And actually, this was the same guy who came back in November of 63 and tried to advise Longstreet on where to plan the attack on the Battle of Fort Sanders. He was not... Uh, he's written about by E. Porter Alexander, for instance, who was the artillerist, um, and, and he said that nobody had anything flattery to, flattering to say about him. So uh, his, his, he, he, did, he didn't end well. He didn't go very far in the Confederate Army. Um, but, and he was particularly, he was written about originally by Brownlow, and then later there's another letter, this is after Brownlow comes back, um, uh, that goes into great detail of all of his sins and, and the misdeeds. Um, another hanging, again, the Harmons, uh, father and son. This gallows is supp was supposedly near um, where the foundry is now, the restaurant near the World's Fair Park. Um, and um, actually, they weren't hanged at the same time. And here again, you can see they made them ride to the gallows on their coffins. Um, the son was hanged first, and then the father was hanged. So he had to watch that. And again, he's, you know, the, here it's the secesh children are cheering, and here's a guy with a drum. He's having a great time. This almost, almost looks like a skull. I mean, it's just, it's not a very flattering picture of the crowd, as you can imagine. He would not have done. But the, uh, thing was, it wasn't, he wasn't just um, angry and remembering. In 1864, in June, there was a very rather sad incident hanging a spy. Ephraim E. Dodd, rebel spy from Texas, a long strings army, was hanged in the city yesterday, having been convicted by a regular court-martial. Actually, he was not convicted at first, and then was. And he was, he was passing our pickets under an assumed name in federal uniform. He had on a federal overcoat, probably taken from the battle of, uh, well, who knows where he got it, but can you imagine in this weather not having, and this was, this is what we're experiencing now is not all that different from what it was like. Snow, ice, freezing temperatures, and a lot of these guys didn't have boots, they didn't have shoes, so he had a stolen federal overcoat on. Um, he said there are 25 citizens of Knoxville, resident spies who ought to hang one by one, but it's appropriate that our authorities hang the spy on the very spot where two years ago the rebels hung the Union men taken out of jail from us. This hanging commenced on the other side and let it go on until compensation is had in part for the hundreds of cold-blooded murders perpetrated in East Tennessee. So he wasn't just fire and brimstone. He was, these, th this guy was actually hanged as a Confederate spy. Uh, probably he wasn't. He had a diary. Uh, he was kind of a young guy, Texas, Terry's Texas Rangers kind of caught, got caught behind lines and he was just in the wrong place in the wrong time. Somebody was going to hang. I'm convinced that there was, they were going to reuse those gallows in a very symbolic way. This is a story of Unionist prisoners being marched off to Tuscaloosa for prison for the rest of the war. And I think this is interesting. This, it looks like Brownlow described to the lithographer what the Knoxville jail looked like, but this isn't really very close. And you can see he put it in the middle of the town. The picture of the Knoxville jail, he's got those columns on it, but it's where the Baptist church is now, and it was pretty much all by itself, and it had a yard and fence around it. So even though it's this, supposed to be the same building, it's, it's, uh, it's not too accurate. It didn't matter. I mean, the, the appeal and the, and the impact was still as strong. Um, in any case, he also showed the abuse of private citizens. And Robert Reynolds, this guy was a Confederate, he was in the Confederate uh, government, I forget exactly what, but he was in local, local government as a Confederate. And uh, he apparently drank. I think he, he was probably well known to drink, but this is maybe a little bit extreme. And uh, again, though, it makes very good, very good propaganda. 
and J. Crozier Ramsey. He was the son of Dr. J. G. M. Ramsey. Uh, he was also the district attorney who had a R Brownlow arrested when Brownlow thought he had protection from the government. And uh, don't know about the details of this incident, but in the book, Brownlow says that Cr Ramsey was convicted as a thief in the Confederate camp, drummed out of camp. There he is. <laughs> Not flattering. And as I said, he named names. This is supposedly an incident that happened with J. Crozier Ramsey. But by this time, when you know the book is out, and he's up in New York City and Philadelphia and Washington and Buffalo and Boston, and he is giving lectures, and he is he got a nice advance and sold. I, I, I meant to double check. I think I saw one place, 100,000 copies of his book. So he did very well financially, and he is now a celebrity. So this is the Illustrated News. This is Harper's Weekly. This is a dime novel, Beatles Dime Biography Library, Biographical Library Number 13, Parson Brownlow. So people are writing about him in addition to the book that he wrote for himself. It's in a kind of a publicity shot. And there was a novel written about the adventures of this fighting parson, and this was one of the illustrations in the novel, 1861 Severe County Speech. Um, the parson is uh, converting the masses here. And he did. He did. Actually, that's not much of an exaggeration. The Union leadership in East Tennessee was extremely influential but, and by spreading the word and getting the electorate on the side of the Union, keeping, keeping that message alive before the uh, election, the, the, the vote came in June of 61. This is a patriotic chapter in the history of the Great Rebellion. And when Brownlow was in jail, he wrote his farewell speech. And he, and he also wrote his speech that he was going to give on the gallows. He apparently believed he was going to be hanged. And so he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote. When you look at these newspapers and realize that one guy pretty much did this every week. Uh, he did reprint letters. He did, sometimes he put in poems. There's some advertising, some court notices, of course. But the editorials or the comments, that things that are uh, more um, timely, he, he, he wrote all this stuff. And he, he wrote an amazing amount. In any case, there was also a portrait and biography of Por a Parson Brownlow. This was just 72 pages, and basically it's a reprint of all the speeches that he gave all over the North. And it went for 25 cents, but again, it was another moneymaker. This is my favorite. This is the Parson Brownlow Quick Step. It's sheet music. Came out in June of 62. Of course, by now he's up in the North, and... Uh, I, I guess I could have copied. I didn't copy the actual music. I don't read music myself. Some of you might have been able to tell what it sounded like. Um, it would probably be fun to, to have somebody play it sometime. I think it's piano music. In any case, though, you can see it went into the uh, June of six, 1863. This became part of the uh, Library of Congress collection. And it was a family effort. Susan Brownlow. That was her real name, but uh, she was the heroine of, and it says, from the beat of butterfly wings. These, this is one of those fragile southern bells, <laughs> who is also now, uh, she's uh, in Harper's, and it tells the story of Miss Brownlow, and, and she confronts these awful, these are the same terrible southern soldiers that are coming and making fun of the flag, and apparently she took a gun out and told them all to go away. There's even a story, written, a, a book of this, published in German, and in that one she's called Maud. So when you go looking for it, that was to protect her, <laughs> her uh, privacy. Of course, it used the name Brownlow, which would be a little bit hard to, yeah. You still have to sell this thing, right? So you call her Maud instead of Susan. And, but in any case, her story, she became, and so she's on the lecture tour with her father, and people want to hear her, and they want to see her. Um, and this is her in later life, and she came back to Knoxville, married. She's buried in Old Grace Cemetery. And uh, this I found very interesting. Mary Brownlow Aiken died in 1934. Uh, she was the youngest child of, of Brownlow and his wife, Eliza. Uh, she was the widow of H.M. Aiken. He uh, was a railroad, railroad owner, organized the Holston Bank, 
And, uh, but it says in her, uh, bio, uh, her obituary that she went to school, probably finishing school, in Philadelphia, and she lived with George Childs. Childs was the guy who discovered Brownlow, who had published his books, went with him on his speaking tour all around. I guess you could say he was his manager. And, uh, uh, she, but she, as the youngest child, went up to Philadelphia after the war and lived with them while she went to finishing school. At any rate, there were also two sons, and these sons are fascinating. This is John Bell Brownlow, 1839 to 1922. He was in the 9th Regiment, Tennessee Union Cavalry. Um, early in, in 1860, he was involved with a murder uh, at Emory and Henry College. And actually, there's a very detailed article defending him, of course, by his father in the paper. Uh, apparently, he was a little guy, and he was attacked by a big guy, and uh, what are you going to do? you got to defend yourself. And he was never convicted of, of any kind of felony. In any case, um, then there was another little story about him. He was reading some kind of book that was supposed to be treasonous against the Confederate government. This was after the war started, and it, and it turned out to be one that he'd actually borrowed from a prominent Confederate. So that went away. But, it, you know, a little bit of publicity before the war. Um, this is the only picture I could find of him uh, in uniform later in life. He worked on the wig after the war. The sons took over the newspaper because Brownlow went to uh, Nashville. He was governor, but we'll get to that. In any case, um, John Bell Brownlow married the daughter of a man named Fouché, who was a dentist here in town, and they're all buried in Old Gray Cemetery. This is the other brother, younger brother, 1842 to 78. And you can see uh, he was on the 1st Tennessee Cavalry. He didn't start out at the 1st Tennessee Cavalry. He actually started out under Andrew Johnson's son-in-law, which everyone said, hmm, how did that happen? <laughs> it was a little bit of a nepotism there. But he, uh, he did not last through the end of the war, and Brown who eventually became colonel of that particular uh, regiment. He died at age 36. He married a woman from Franklin, and he's buried in Franklin, Tennessee, and they, they did not have children. Other pictures? I just found this one. It says, your affectionate nephew. Not sure who this went to, but it was this Jim Brownlow. And then there's a wonderful regimental history that you can read in great detail of the 1st Tennessee Cavalry. All sorts of details. And uh, this, is, this is Jim Brownlow. This is the Thornburg. I think it's Russell. It says Major Thornburg. That's another fa local family who were cavalry. And there's a Burkhart in here somewhere. Let's see. Where was he? Uh, no? <laughs> he was a major. I think he's in here. I might have cut him off. But in any, in any case, this is the uh, regimental photograph of the officers. I'm going to just read this quickly because I think this is a great story. It's a naked charge, and this is Jim Brownlow. July 9, 64, Brownlow's men were ordered to dislodge CSA cavalry at a supposed fort, ford near Powers Ferry. They found the river impassable. Joseph Dorr of the 8th Iowa Cavalry Regiment, acting commander of the brigade, arrived on the scene and ordered Brownlow to complete the mission. Brownlow then devised one of the most unusual raids of the Civil War, if not in all military history. He had most of his men keep up a steady fire from their side of the shore while he led a squad of nine men to a point about one mile upstream, where they put their guns in cartridge boxes on a small wooden raft and swam naked across the Chattahoochee. Leaving one man to guard the raft, Brownlow led his naked men through the woods as they somewhat painfully proceeded without shoes or other clothing for cover. Brownlow ordered them to cuss low so as not to give themselves away. When they reached the Confederate position, they emerged clothed only with cartridge boxes, screaming and shooting. The scene so startled the Confederate defenders that most of them immediately fled to the woods, leaving 12 men to be taken prisoner. After swimming back across the river, Brownlow's men expressed even more admiration for their commander who was willing to share the hardships and dangers of the mission and not just to order others to carry out the unusual and uncomfortable task. <laughs> so, apparently he was an innovative kind of colonel. In 1862, Philadelphia, getting back to Brownlow's rise of notoriety, Mrs. Brownlow and Mr. And he, these are both done at the McAllister and Brothers Chestnut Street Gallery. Um, Brownlow's shop, well, as I said, he was, he stopped publishing in 60, 
1 October. He was imprisoned in December. He was sent out of town in 62 uh, um, uh, March. And so, and then he came back. He came back with Burnside in 63 September. So, but for a year or so there, he was out of town, and the Confederate authorities took over his printing presses, and they used the machinery to retool rifles for the Confederate Army. He was not happy with that. Um, this is his house. He lived very um, modestly. He lived uh, at 213 East Cumberland, which is kind of under the James White Parkway now or something. It's gone. Um, and some sources said he owned domestic slaves. I've never seen that in writing, but he was certainly pro-slavery. If he were rich enough, he probably would have. But interesting, when you look at old images, for instance, notice the trees are small. Um, I've used this step. It's kind of shorter here and longer here because this is going downhill. Um, Undated photographs, actually I flipped this one, it, it original, the original copy I saw had the longer stairs that way. Anyway, I think this is right and you can see now, even though it's undated, you can see how much the trees have grown. And again, this is a postcard, makes it a little more interesting. But here, it, I don't know exactly what date, but you see how big the tree is now. It hangs out over the road. We've got utility poles, so we know it's going to be later. But it's got to be before 1923 because the house was torn down in 1923. Uh, apparently, after the war, after and well, he died in 77, uh, Mrs. Brownlow lived on into the 1900s, and she was regularly visited by every Republican who came to town. Every politician came to visit Mrs. Brownlow. In any case... Brownlow, the return of Brownlow and the Union. He had the full support of the conquering army. Remember, he's, he's been out of town for a while. He left in November, uh, March of 62. He comes back in September of 63 with Burnside, with um, the ability, the money support from the Union to um, put his paper back into commission. They want a Unionist voice in the South, so he has the full support of the Union army. But just watch out, any of you guys who were against him when he left, when he was down, payback, Whig and Rebel Ventilator. That's the new name of his paper. Um, he was especially furious with the ladies. He thought that snobbery and power, there was always a class war. He was, uh, he remembered being uh, completely um, disrespected, you might say, by the ladies when he was in jail and when he was exiled. There's not many people who really get to come back in a position of power. I mean, I, I can't, I, I'm not surprised he was unrestrained, actually. Um, he was still furious with the ministers. He renewed and increased his belligerence, especially the Methodists, and he made sure that Ministers were some of the very first to be exiled, sent out at Knoxville, and go, go to the Confederacy. You want to be Confederate? Go do it there. And um, actually, after the war, he went after the Methodist, Southern Methodist Church property on Church Street. Um, he put all sorts of lawsuits into place. Rebel property, there were all these notices in the paper that said, okay, so-and-so, if you don't show up in court, for this, then it'll be decided against you. On the other hand, if you came, come back, we're going to kill you. So it was kind of a no-win situation for a lot of rebel property issues. And also now, what a platform. He is funded by the government. They want this union voice in the South. In any case, this is what the new uh, head, is that called Masthead, I think, uh, Brownlow's newspaper and rebel ventilator. And here he is. He's got a kind of a new look. This one I like. It's kind of Lincoln. This card is actually in the carte de visite collection of Mrs. O.P. Temple. He was a very prominent unionist. It's in special collections at UT. Um, and he's back in the other chair. Um, when he, he put out, out only a couple of issues, and one of them is here, November 11th. Um, and then all of a sudden he looks up and, oops, Longstreet is coming back to Knoxville. This is not a good position for him to be in, thinking about the Confederates taking the town over again. So he leaves town. Leaves his family here, though. Um, and, but he comes back in January after the battle, and he's, he's secure again and really 
now he's, he's, he's sure he's secure. And he is vicious in his attacks on former rebels. He expels the ministers. Harrison from First Presbyterian, Martin from Second Presbyterian, Lewis, who was an, uh, a Methodist minister but very much pro-Confederate. Uh, there's a letter from somebody somewhere writing to the, the um, paper saying, oh, my long-lost relative, Isaac Lewis, so glad to hear his name. I'm looking for him. And Brownlow writes back, yeah, don't even bother looking for him. He's going south. Uh, he's not a friendly response. And of course, the, the she rebels. Ellen Renshaw House talks about him. Uh, he expels uh, Mrs. Kane. He expels Sue Ramsey. These ladies, he has, he's just over it, and they are leaving town. And there's an incident that happens when on Dr. Curry's porch, and I've just found out recently, he lived at the corner of Gay and Asylum, and Dr. Curry was a Confederate. He was uh, in the Confederate Army as a surgeon. Um, and the, the uh, young women, including Ellen Renshaw House, watch Confederate prisoners being marched out of town, and they wave their gloves and handkerchiefs. Wow. This kind of brazen hussyism is not to be tolerated. And they are eventually, and not too soon, not too far in the future, all those, all those names are expelled, the, those young women. Um, and he published all the names of the Confederate defenders. Remember, his, Landon Hayes was in charge, but there are lots of civilians on the lines. He makes sure he finds out who they are, and he publishes their names in the newspaper. He also, to embarrass them, publishes all the names of the Confederates who take the oath to the United States. He, he thinks that that should be very public. Everybody has to do it. And when you do it, your name's going to be put out there for, for all your friends to see. Also, many lawsuits, as I said. They're suing for property. They're suing for damages. They're suing for um, uh, debts. And property is being confiscated. J.G.M. Ramsey, is, he, he's been his en enemy forever. Um, and they were special targets. Sue is one of the young females expelled. But J.G.M.'s son, Jay Crozier, uh, uh, is up in Bristol, actually. And um, he, uh, the son in, um, oh, let me think, I think it's the, I can't remember, 64, 65. Anyway, he's arrested Jay, Jay Crozier Ramsey, the former district attorney who put Brownlow in jail, is arrested. He's marched back into Knoxville in chains. He's put into jail, along with Robert Fox, Castle Fox. Very ironic, the jailer is jailed in his own jail, and then they're put in irons, they're put in balls and chains, and it's uh, quite a public demonstration of retribution. And the Whig, Whig said, no rebel should be allowed to live in East Tennessee, and if they show up, they should be ventilated. So this is not a good time. And it's certainly not healing the wounds. He has no intention of healing the wounds. And then the war's over. So, you know, this goes on for a 64, part of 65. And he finds himself really kind of uh, allowed to go to the state level. Uh, he's, the sen he's the governor of the state from 65 to 69. Then he's senator from 69 to 75. So he has that kind of power. He's now, again, viciously anti-Johnson. And as you know, Johnson's not doing too well in the White House anyway. Um, and even though they're not friends, they were kind of colleagues, and, and Brownlow was spoken of in the same, same terms. East Tennessean, uh, very powerful. His sons take over the newspaper. They can have a direct line to the governor's office. And interesting, there is no governor's mansion. He kind of lives in a room in the Capitol building. But everything that's happening there is immediately, and with a very distinct bias, published in the Whig which is it's back the wig now. He doesn't call it the rebel ventilator anymore. But he's been accused of fixing elections. For one thing, ex-rebels can't vote. And he thinks they never should be allowed to vote. And so as a very small minority statewide, I mean, unionists were yeah, pretty much the majority in East Tennessee, but statewide they certainly were not. But he, gets managed, he manages by not allowing ex-Confederates to vote uh, to, get, to get elected to office. And then he is uh, kind of infamously nepotism, many friends and, and um, people are appointed to powerful offices. He coerces the legislature when he tries to get legislation passed that the legislature won't show up, so he goes out, physically rounds them up. They won't vote, so he fires on them. And they say there are still bullet holes in the, in the state house. I don't know if that's true. I wouldn't be surprised if it were true. 
And he got out the vote, how to get the vote out, and this is when he comes up with rights for African Americans. So he, he enfranchises African Americans. It's quite early, quite unusual. Um, but there's that old, uh, old poem, a line, a couplet from a poem that says, that the last temptation is the greatest of treason to do the right thing for the wrong reason. He needed votes. And oh, this was this is great. Frank H. McClung, for whom our museum is named, uh, he was over, worth over twenty thousand dollars, and you had to write personally to the president and and apply for a pardon. And so Frank's letter is is very nicely written, and we have a copy of it. And on the outside of it, in pencil, it says, "Do not. This man was a notorious rebel from the first of the war to the end of the war. Do not pardon him, Brownlow." So he was taking an interest in the local population on a very personal level. And of course, Reconstruction in Tennessee. Um, you know, legacy, as I said, I wanted to like this guy. I wanted to go into it thinking, you know, strange times, irrational times, strange places. I think the best thing you can say that irrational times facilitate the advancement of extremists. Somehow, some things never change. Memory of oppression is long lasting. Once civil discord, debate, and compromise vanish, we're left with extreme polemics. Hmm. Minority rule. As far as the parson was concerned, as Confederates should never be allowed to vote, but since they outnumbered him, that was going to be hard to enforce. Enfranchisement of African Americans was a very touchy issue all over the South, and as you know, uh, we're still experiencing repercussions from the various ways it was finally enacted rise of the Klan right here in Pulaski, Tennessee. And that's not a, not a good time in American history. And simmering reprisals. For instance, you all heard about his portrait in the Capitol. There was an actual bill uh, submitted by the Democrats in 1967 that permanently removed Brownlow's portrait. This portrait was commissioned in 1866. George, I think George, I meant to double check that. Anyway, Drury, artist Drury, cost a thousand dollars, and it was in the Capitol building for a long, long time. And apparently, people spat at it, and uh, there was so much uh, contentiousness about it. It is now in the museum, in the State Museum. I think it's on display. I, I, I called the museum. And I could. I. I had a well, anyway, phone call got interrupted and I never got to ask the question. But I believe it is on display. It should be. Um, and anyway, but after all of that, his newspapers are an enormous storehouse of firsthand history. It's a chronicle of the developing frontier, nation building, civil war, and reconstruction. It's larger accomplishments, I believe, is document documentation of a singular time and place from settlement to the most wrenching of social upheaval, which is civil war. And then there's the aftermath, the retribution, the leadership vacuums, regionalism, religious sectarianism, defeat, victory, their toll on the population here. Um, emancipation, citizenship, community building, enfranchisement, and racism. We're still dealing with those issues. He couldn't possibly solve them. Um, and I, I came to the conclusion where maybe we expected a little too much from a self-educated frontiersman who pushed himself into a position of excessive power because he could. And the fluidity of law and institutions were created by this unprecedented social upheaval. It's let him in and made him, after, after that, he made up what he did. And Parson was no Abraham Lincoln, but then nobody else was either. So let me just look, show you here. These are, this is his legacy. This is all the different names that his paper was published. Tennessee Whig from 30 to 40. Um, then he got thrown out of Elizabeth then, and he published the Whig and then changed the name to Jonesboro Whig. He was there until 49 when he pretty much got thrown out of Jonesboro, and he came to Knoxville. And then it was Brownlow's Whig, an independent journal, Brownlow's Knoxville Whig, Brownlow's Weekly Whig, Brownlow's Knoxville Whig and Rebel Ventilator, then once again, Brownlow's Knoxville Whig, yada yada. It goes, he published this paper for 38 years. These are the issues at Library of Congress. There's, uh, 
I have spent hours, <laughs> literally, you get so caught up in reading, just reading the, the business ads or the patent medicine. Apparently, they had a cure for cancer back then. It's all over the paper. Uh, you know, it's the uh, truth in advertising, the things that people say impress the divorce notices. There were a lot of divorces. I didn't even, I thought they didn't, but they certainly did. And then the legal fights, the feuds, the names of people you see that have appeared in so many other ways in history, and then they pop up and I say, oh, he was, he, he owned a, uh, a livery, for instance, or, or just the things that the details that don't necessarily get into the history books inadvertently get into the newspapers. If you're at all interested, this is a wonderful uh, research tool, Chronicling America, Library of Congress, you can read every single issue and put it up on the big, uh, let's see, let me see if I can show you what it looks like. I meant to make this easy. As I said, this was kind of the part. Um, it wasn't as smooth as I wanted it to be. Let's see if I can find what the newspaper looked like. Okay. Now, that's not easy to see. <laughs> Some of them are better. If you bring it up to 100%, you can see a little bit better how it goes. But in these J. Um, Brownwell family, oh, here, here he was being accused of, of being behind the uh, shooting of Dr. Harvey Baker. And he gives you a very detailed account of where all the Brownlow family was when Dr. Baker was shot. This was in June of 63 and why they weren't involved. Um, so it, it's just fascinating to go through and uh, it shows up a lot better when you do it yourself. So I'm not going to show any more of that. Um, you can, you know, Harper's Weekly. This is the Knoxville Courthouse. This is the building that was also part of the jail, the one that I think he was probably in. This is his office. These are rebel troops, or Union troops, greeting him and his family. In any case, Library of Congress has a huge amount of information about Brownlow and the wonderfulness of his, um, let me just put this up again. I want to put that website up so that you know how to find. If you're, if you're interested in reading, it goes back to the beginning of his paper when he started about 1839 and then it goes through 1877. The paper continued under William Rule, who is a name that people who know Knoxville history might recognize, um, and actually went a very long time um, and uh, um, continues now to be one of the best sources of Knoxville history. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Anybody? No? Yes. Thank you for giving us an example of how papers were run back in those days. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, some things are, well, I don't know. We have, we have illusions about the past being somehow more mannerly, more, more gentle, more intellectual. Yeah, not so. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Uh, in the adver no, in the advertisements, you'll see uh, examples of, um, oh, for instance, McClung, McClung, Cowan and McClung building facade, or pictures of um, uh, pianos that are being sold, but not illustrations of the news stories. No. And now, going forward in time, I didn't go much past uh, 67. I'm sure the journal. As it, as it progressed, did, bring, did incorporate illustrations, but not under Brownlow's regime. Well, be safe. Oh, yes, one more question. Uh, well, no, that was an illustration from the novel. I'll, I'll get you the title of the novel. That, that, was the, that was the illustration title, and it was the parson in Sevier County giving a political speech on unionism. Um, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll, get you, I'll get you the author and, and title specifically. 
All right, well, be safe out there, everybody. Let's leave before everything refreezes. <laughs> and come on back next month. We'll talk about railroads. <laughs>